Hello everybody. I would like to talk about donations. On the internet, I would advise you to donate to your favourite sites, where asked. One of the most important ways in which you can help to get your message across is to donate to your favourite sites. Even small amounts make huge differences to the site owners, and they help to inject your views into cyberspace. And the more that your views are injected into cyberspace, the more will the real world begin to reflect those views. Even small amounts, $10, helps a lot. After all, money talks. And it talks very loudly, it seems to me. Indeed, no money equals almost no voice. I myself do contribute to a number of websites, actually, not very large amounts, but they range. Uh, the websites range from those concerned with men's issues, uh, and I support some men's rights, men's rights activists with my donations. I also um, give small donations to sites that produce podcasts that I find enjoyable and that and that I tend to listen to every week. Uh, science podcasts uh, are my favourite. And I like listening to philosophy podcasts and a few tech podcasts. But whatever your interest, if you want your website, your favorite websites, your favorite podcasts, your favorite authors and presenters to grow in influence, then yes, there are many ways that you can help them to do so by publicizing them uh, whenever you are on the internet and elsewhere. But donating small amounts of money is a very effective way of, of making those websites grow and of making those authors better well known. They will likely know far better than you what to do to make their websites and their views more popular. And they can use your donations to do this. Furthermore, as someone who has received donations in the past to Angry Harry. Donations have a great motivating effect. They are very re rewarding because they let you know that other people really do appreciate what you are doing. And that is a strong spur to further action. In connection with The Voice for Men in particular, um, I have, for example, on occasion, seen even MRAs um, complaining about the fact that um, Paul Elam asks for donations to his website. And I can assure you, and I can, I can assure those who, um, who tend to have doubts about the effectiveness of donations, that they are wrong. Donations make a big difference, not only because they encourage the people whom you support to continue with their activities, but also donations help them to purchase the appropriate equipment and time with which to do their job, a job that you want them to do. Furthermore, donations can help people to purchase outside assistance and the money can also be used to fund publicity in the form of advertising. And AVFM needs all of these things to be successful. Without donations, AVFM would not be so effective. But Paul has also used the money to uh, fund numerous activities. In fact, I would like to see Paul Elam make a million dollars. That would be fantastic. Of course, he's going to be lucky to end up with a thousand dollars in his pocket at the end of the year. But I would like it to be a million. Because if Paul Elam makes a million dollars, well, firstly, I know exactly what he'll do with it. He'll buy himself numerous screens and huge professional microphones, super fast computers, no doubt a huge camera so that we can see him in all his glory. He would probably hire 
professional experts in public relations and media marketing, and he'll be scheming up all sorts of ways in which to further men's rights, because that is who he is. That's what motivates the guy. His whole life revolves around these issues. And so your money couldn't be better spent. It's who he is. I know the guy. I've been watching him for years. Even with a million dollars, he'll still be spending his life on the internet. That's what people like him do. They are committed activists. That money isn't going anywhere, except into something and someone that will benefit you. So I would like to see Paul Elam make a million, preferably two. And I would like to see other people make an awful lot of money by helping men's rights to grow in the consciousness of the public. I would like to see lawyers making millions of dollars by pursuing men's rights. I would like to see comedians making money out of perhaps pillorying and denigrating the feminists, sneering at them, making fun of them on the stage. I would like to see uh, writers who are pro-men's rights make a lot of money. And politicians, I would like them to receive a lot of money and get a lot of votes. There's nothing wrong in... Uh, making money out of this business because that's the way the world works out there and if you think otherwise you are sadly misinformed because that is the way the world out there really works and more so now thanks to the internet where people can support with their words and with their funding any group or any political activity that they wish to and at this point in time, there really is no better investment for men than to invest in men's rights activism. Indeed, if men don't step up and do so, the world for them will continue to become a much more depressing place. And I would say the same for women too. So, for those of you who particularly those who don't have the time to engage in activism or who can't or who can't engage in activism because of let's say their jobs then one good way of doing your bit is to stick your hand in your wallet every so often and to hand some money over to those whom you would like to see prosper and not necessarily just those who are for men's rights as i mentioned earlier any website or any person out there who is representing your point of view or who gives you pleasure by producing videos or podcasts or, or, or articles that you would like to see uh, more often, you would like to see other people uh, being made aware of, then put your hand in your wallet and help to fund them. And to repeat myself, small donations are very, very important. So please don't feel ever that your $10 is not worth sending, because it is. And with particular regard to AVFM, I would like to remind people that men's rights activists have been in operation for over a hundred years, and they have achieved virtually nothing. And this includes highly visible campaigning groups like Fathers for Justice, who have achieved enormous publicity for their message right across the world. Even in faraway places like China and India, people all over the world know who Fathers for Justice uh, represents and what they are aiming to achieve. And yet, they have achieved almost nothing. And this was why AVFM was formed in the first place. Paul Elam decided that enough was enough, uh, that talking and uh, discussing men's issues was not going anywhere, nobody was listening, nobody cared. In fact, such debates have been shut down ever since I can remember, often with threats of intimidation, of violence, with threats 
to people's jobs, to their careers, to their livelihoods, their status, even to their families. And this kind of intimidation hasn't gone away. It's still going on. And Paul Elam decided that the only way forward was to create hell, to take on the feminists with aggression and invective so that they would have to respond and that publicity would be generated for men's issues. And he has achieved this. This was his aim. It is still his aim. And I can assure you that he isn't going to stop. As an aside, let me briefly give you some examples of what anyone talking about men's issues had to endure a decade or so ago. Example one. About 12 years ago, a British lawyer wrote a very innocuous article in the Times of London, a world-famous newspaper, wherein he pointed out that men occasionally got a raw deal in the family courts. But he did not dare use his name. The Times merely introduced him as a barrister who wished to remain anonymous. That gives you an idea of how dangerous it would have been to his career, or her career, if they had dared to suggest that men had got a raw deal in the family courts. Example 2. An article in some mainstream newspaper that uh, I can't remember now, pointed out that eight times as much money was being spent on women's health issues in the UK when compared to men's health issues. Eight times as much. But the article suggested that this was a shock. I contacted the author and asked him how this could possibly be a shock. Because I had known that there was a huge disparity for some time. He told me that he had to write the article in this manner so as not to upset vulnerable women who might feel guilty about this disparity and hence not seek medical help when necessary. In other words, the government and the media, the feminist-dominated media, did not want men to know that eight times as much money was being spent on women's health. Example 3. The United Kingdom men's movement was a small movement that was uh, very functional during the 90s. And as it was uh, the beginning of the internet, certainly for hear us in the UK, uh, websites were very flat in those days. And in the case of this website, uh, by the United Kingdom men's movement, it was basically one page which pointed out that the domestic violence statistics were skewed. And it also suggested that feminism had something to do with it. But there was no rudeness and no hostility. Well, guess what? Some of the main search engines delisted the website from their search pages. This was before Google's existence. But the point is this. Even the slightest criticism of feminism would result in such shutdowns. Example 4. A long time ago I used to run a site that consisted only of about six pages, mostly to do with science, technology, medicine and stuff like that. One page devoted to each topic. But I had one page that was devoted to men's issues. Now at the time I made no comments on those pages. There was no Angry Harry, there were no references to Angry Harry. There was no links to Angry Harry. And the Men's Issues page was simply an ever-increasing list of paragraphs culled from mainstream publications with links. Topics to do with divorce, child access, domestic violence, but no Angry Harry and no comments by me. And yet, simply because of this page... I had problems with advertisers and web hosters, and I would sometimes receive emails with the usual insults. You have a small penis, your mother didn't breastfeed you, and so on. Just because I had one page 
devoted to men's issues. And let me repeat, none of these people were aware that I ran a site called Angry Harry. There was no connection. Example 5. Film and TV producers, scriptwriters, even in Hollywood, were ceaselessly being bombarded with hysterical claims that, for example, should they portray false accusations of abuse, sexual, domestic violence, or otherwise, then they will be harming victims. And so they stopped doing so. In other words, false accusations by women could not even be portrayed in fiction. The idea being to continually indoctrinate the public with the belief that all accusations are true. When it comes to such things, women are always the victims and men are always the perpetrators. This has gone on for decades. Indeed, there was also an accepted prescription that prevented fictional plots ever portraying women as being deserving of some kind of retribution, especially violence. In other words, women should never be portrayed as doing acts worthy of retribution. Men, of course, are forever being portrayed as being worthy of having violence directed against them. Most people just have no idea of what a stranglehold feminists and various women's groups have had and continue to have over the media, over companies, businesses, corporations, politicians, academics and so on, right throughout our society at all levels. And if you think that this was solely about a concern for women, you're wrong. So, example six. It was in about the year 2000, I think, when I first realised that feminists had no real concern for women. I had stumbled upon an article by two American gynaecologists who were complaining about the fact that no editor in a mainstream women's media publication would publish well-established findings that showed that many tens of thousands of women every year were actually destroying their chances of ever reproducing because they were delaying too long to have babies. The claim of the doctors was that in order to encourage as many women as possible to embark upon careers, feminists did not want women to know that they stood a good chance of missing their reproductive opportunities. In other words, basically, these feminists didn't want women to have children and they were quite prepared to block medical advice which told them of the consequences of delay. And they had a huge influence on these women. I don't know what the medical situation is now, but we do know that millions of women delayed for too long, largely thanks to feminist deceit and feminist dishonesty. So never kid yourselves that feminists are genuinely concerned about women, because they're not. Well, I could go on. But essentially, nobody could speak about men's issues, if you spoke about men's issues at all, even in the most innocuous way. You would find yourself on the receiving end of some kind of trouble or problem, even UK lawyers. And this kind of thing still goes on today, all over the place. And this is why Paul Elam became who he became when it comes to men's activism. His message to the feminists was this. I am a shit who doesn't give a damn anymore. I will chase you, I will harass you, and I will draw people's attention to men's rights whether you like it or not, and you will not stop me. The time for MRAs attempting to talk to you, is over. So, I hope that some of you will better understand why he does what he does. Those are his tactics. You might not agree with them, 
but they are effective and they are the only tactics that I have ever seen working. I have seen nothing else produce the kind of publicity for men's rights issues than has been produced by Paul Elam. And so I would say to you this, if you have time, support AVFM. If you have some spare money, support AVFM. And together we will change this world so that it is a much better world, not only for men but for women too. We are going to do this anyway, without your help. We now have numerous men's rights activists, some within the men's rights movement, and observably so, others working behind the scenes, on our behalf, inside their own professions, inside their own jobs. People from all walks of life. Police officers, prison officers, lawyers, journalists, psychologists, and many others. And so I have no doubt at all that eventually we will succeed. This is an unstoppable movement, which is hardly surprising since men make up half the population. There are some three billion males on this planet. And so there is no question in my mind that men's rights issues are increasingly on the agenda and that men's rights activists have the capability to push the agenda right through to the end. But do you really want us to take 20 years to achieve this? With your support, financial or otherwise, we can get this job done much more quickly. And finally, for any feminists who are listening to this, I have a message for you. It's over. Feminism is being exposed for what it really is. An ideology that is exactly as Erin Pitsy describes it. An evil empire. And as United Kingdom Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher once said, it is poison. By which she meant it was poisonous to society. It is a thoroughly revolting ideology that is based on lies, dishonesty, bullying, intimidation and very often violence, and whose main purpose seems to be to provide funding for various groups of thoroughly despicable activists, often who masquerade as defenders of women when they are no such thing. They are manipulators of women for profit. Feminism is first and foremost about generating money and power by supporting the thoroughly obnoxious views of people who wish to stir up hatred toward men to profit from doing so. More than anything else, it's a great money spinner and a vote winner. And it's the oldest trick in the book to demonize a group of people in order to stir up fear of them, to stir up hatred toward them, to claim that you can protect people from this horrible group and to gain power and money by doing so. The Catholics had the devil, the Muslims, the infidel, the Nazis, the Jews, and the feminists, men, all men. Bar the heavy violence, feminism is almost an image of Nazism with people being horribly discriminated against in many areas of life and demonized horribly and continually while forever being threatened if they dare step out of line or speak out of turn simply because of their genetic code. In this case, they have a Y chromosome. But feminists cannot hide behind their lies anymore. These are documented going back decades, as is their unbridled hatred of men. And in many cases, they reveal a level of professional dishonesty that will, in some cases, surely lead to significant personal and professional consequences. It's just a question of time before some of these people are brought to book. And what we see in the ever-growing men's rights movements is men and women of all colours 
and all sexual persuasions joining it. Personally speaking, I am almost astonished to see just how wide is the variety of people who are now supporting men's rights activism. Ten years ago, some 98% of MRAs were men. These days, it's probably down to 80%. In this short podcast, I cannot possibly explain why it is that this movement will continue to grow and why the feminists haven't got a hope in hell of continuing successfully with their horrible agendas and their blatant misandry. But all the signs are there. It is an ideology that is crumbling from the inside, that is leaking supporters, and that is attracting more and more hostility from a wider variety of sources, even from some women who claim to be feminists, such as Professor Christina Hoff Sommers. So it is over. The only question that I want to address here is this one. How long do you want this to take? In my opinion, the sooner we get rid of feminism, the better. And if you feel the same way, one good way of achieving this is to support AVFM, or indeed any other MRAs or their sites, if you think that they are more effective, or that they more accurately represent your views. But whatever the case, please give your support. And remember, no one is going to stop this movement from growing. It really is absolutely unstoppable. Thank you for listening.